Well, it's a warm welcome to Andrew Waller, Chief Executive of Grindrod. Uh, interesting to see. This is probably the last time we're going to talk to you about financial results, Andrew, as you are going to be replaced by your FD uh, at the beginning of next year. I thought you were a bit young to be retiring. Have, are, you, are you cashing in all those shares that, that Grindrod is talking about? Uh, Alec, uh, no, no, a, a, a long planned transition. Uh, I'm, I'm 60 now. Um, I've been at Grinrod uh, 12 years, uh, working with Mike Hankinson as the chairman. Uh, as you know, uh, Cheryl Carolis came in to replace him now in May. And we have been working on a strategy, as you're probably aware, of returning to the core in each of our business businesses that we had uh, and bundled shipping. And now we found the home for bank that we've been looking for all this time. And of course, Kalani, having been the FD for a long time, then moved into freight as the CEO. And uh, and yes, freight is the business now. Time for me to move on. It's fantastic when you have this kind of succession planning. We don't see it too often in South African corporates. But the fact that the two of you have been working together for 12 years and then telegraphed, uh, that you would be yeah, exactly. leaving at the same time. It's been quite a run, though. When I had a look at your share price earlier, it's just been one-way traffic since the beginning of this year. Has business been that good? So, Alec, uh, you know, uh, it was really important that we got back to our core, and, 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 and that talks about freight services as well, as well as what we ca- called for a number of years the non-core assets. And the non-core assets, unfortunately, we're always putting – debits because we were trying to exit these businesses in the middle of the COVID pandemic and it wasn't easy. But qu- quietly while we were dealing with the non-core, Kalani was getting on with, uh, with freight services and making sure he focused on the customer, uh, understanding where they needed to go out, the, uh, out of the, uh, the country or the subcontinent. And yes, we have seen some, some tailwinds with the mining and agri, which we are so fortunate to have in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which seem to be much more resilient uh, during these times, you know, uncertain times that we have. You do compete with the state? No, not, we, we don't see it at all. Uh, we work, in fact, with uh, Transnet every single day in all of our businesses, just about, certainly the South African businesses. And we need them to be strong and, and firing as well in order that we also can fire. So where you see our stunning results in Maputo, uh, most of that comes on Transnet Freight Rail and, of course, CFM, which, uh, which both provide rail for us into to Matola and into, indeed into the main port. Just explain that. So essentially, uh, all the product that comes through uh, Matola and Maputo main port and at Richards Bay is all on Transit Freight Rail and CFM and the customer contracts with them directly, TFR and CFM. And then we obviously do the terminaling and the handling onto the, onto the vessel. So your side of it, which is, I suppose, stemmed from the shipping. Grindrod being a family business that was very big in shipping and has been around yeah. in KZN yeah. for, is it over 100 years? Indeed, yeah. Absolutely came from the shipping way back when, 110 years ago and more. Uh, one of the founders, obviously the Grindrod family, uh, started on, on, on ships agency and, and then bought a little ship and sailed the seas around sub, uh, Southern Africa uh, and then came along on shore. And you'll remember the big push was when Ivan Clark uh, managed to make all that money in the shipping markets, we then invested quite heavily on the land side. And that has turned out to be very successful given these results that we've just seen that you've released today for the six months to the end of June. Uh, revenue up 31%, headline earnings up 53%. And this is already on a very strong year last year. Indeed. And, and I think that's right. You've got to focus on your business, focus on your core and keep delivering the, the results six months after six months after six months. Right? And if you do that long enough, eventually the market will trust you and your share price will perform. And, and that's obviously what we've got to focus on. And, and I know Kalani's focused on that going forward, focusing on the business and, and then the results will, will come. Right? How much non-core business is actually left? You know, we've done a, a hell of a job. You'll remember we had to split out the private equity from the bank. Uh, uh, and that had a number of businesses in it. And we've been through a process with the team to sell off a lot of those businesses and largely to the other owner or the other owners uh, because you find it very difficult to sell to another party who, who the owner doesn't know, you know. And, and, and not, not being able to get top dollar because you're in a COVID scenario, uh, that's been quite stressful for us. But a lot of that now is gone. We've got one left to go and, and that's looking positive. And then... Uh, we call them non-core uh, uh, marine fuels. You remember that was a big part of our business when we had the shipping business as well. Um, that business is still doing well, 
uh, and we haven't managed to find a buyer for it. So obviously, we've got to go back to the drawing board and see. You know, luckily, it's a good business, uh, making good money. So it's not a drain on us. And then, then we have uh, an exposure to some land up the north coast. But these non-core assets are not costing us. Uh, they're not a drag on us. They don't have debt against them anymore. Um, uh, we hope we can convert them into cash in the short term, but it, it'll be now in Kalani's uh, uh, time frame that, w- that we'll get through through the land and the marine fuels. Andrew, I was interested to see that you've got 10,000 shareholders now for JSE listed companies. That's a lot of shareholders. It might not seem like a lot to you, but it certainly is. However, your biggest one there, um, we all know about the family. Are they still involved? And then secondly, Remgro, what, what kind of a stake do they have? Yes, uh, so it is a, a, an amazing number of shares, and I think it does hark back to those those prior years, you know, when when uh, the shipping business was doing so well. So Remgro owned just short of 25%, the in and around 25%. The family are at 10%, and we've got uh, PIC at 10 So quite tied up, the shares quite tied up, but you, you can get to over 50% with four or five people, right? So um, I know PSG asset managers own 10% as well. So there you go, 25, 10, 10, and 10. You, you're already at 45, right? Or 55. Well, you got the, you got to pat them on the back, PSG asset managers, because they've had a heck of a ride. Uh, however, when you have yep. a look ahead, given that you're off a very much higher base now, do you need the mineral commodity markets to remain strong for Grindrod to continue performing, or do you have other things in the pipeline? And that's uh, that's exactly right. Uh, like, uh, for years and years and years, people have measured us against the mineral markets. And and, and if I could hark back for a few years before, uh, Rand dollar exchange rates, uh, mining commodity prices. And sure, if coal and, and drops to 50 and iron ore drops to 50, it will make a big dent into us because that's a lot of what uh, Matola is about. But that therein lies uh, Kalani's efforts over the last while. Lots of work on manganese, lots of work on chrome, lots of work on graphite. And that's just in the mineral space. We've obviously, as you've seen, we've got that tie-up with Maersk on the citrus side. So a lot of work on containers to to work with citrus. And then as you now pushes up into East Africa, we have a couple of projects in East Africa that'll get us into more of the cargo space as well. So absolutely, we are tied to minerals. Uh, we're very fortunate as, at the moment, as we said at the outset. Uh, but a lot of work being done on the diversification. So we're not uh, we're not too. Uh, um, affected by a, a, an iron ore price that may come off, which has been very vol- volatile recently, uh, and we've been fine. But uh, at the moment, it's uh, as you know, everyone is trying to find space to get product into ships. So we're very, very fortunate right, right at the moment. It, it seems as though as much coal as could possibly leave the country is going out because of the demand after the Ukraine war. Is that what you're experiencing in reality? Indeed, but remember, Alec, we have these facilities that we contract out for, for long periods of time in advance, So, and we've got major customers in the magnetite side. So our biggest commodity, in fact, in our results are chrome and magnetite. And yes, we have coal, and at a time like this, we wish we had plenty more capacity to help the coal miners, and it's just not always available, right? And certainly if, uh, in, in times of peaks, when the, when the price is where they are, they're very desperate to get it out there. But they weren't there a little while back, right? And, and you can't build a, a, a facility for a one-year or two-year uh, increase in coal price. Um, so, yes, we've made lots of other areas available. Uh, the teams have been working flat out on that to try and get uh, space for, for miners. And, and we talked a little bit about it in our presentation this morning as well. Um, uh, but uh, we're still mainly uh, magnetite and chrome is our, our two big products. Uh, followed by coal and, and then graphite. So in the presentation to investment analysts this morning, what were they asking you most about? What did they want to know uh, more about? <laughs> uh, Alec, uh, as you would expect, they all wanted to know when they can get their hands on the 1.5 billion rand that African Bank are going to pay us for Grinrod Bank. Um, uh, it's very presumptuous to assume that we are going to clear all the hurdles. We we got our shareholder approval at 99%, which we expected. Uh, but, you know, we've received a couple of rounds of questions from the Competition Commission and the same on the Reserve Bank. We've answered all of those. We don't expect there to be problems, uh, but not to be too presumptuous. And then uh, there's a lot of work for us to do around what projects we have, 
when they'll happen and whether how much of the 1.5 uh, we use for what. And the board has asked us to come back in November with a, a quite a comprehensive plan on that. So that was one of the questions. Uh, the other big question was around um, how much can we, how much more can we bring on stream at times like this to get the coal out the out the country, uh, and of course we've been working with all sorts of parties to try and help uh, uh, with the, the export uh, of their product at the moment. If if you go back to when you started as CEO in 2018, it appeared at the time that there was a different strategy that was embarked upon. Um, and that this strategy is now really, really paying off uh, very handsomely. Was it, was it always your intention, you and Mike Hankinson as the chairman, that you would get to this point and then both hand over? Uh, I, I, th- I think it's right for the business. You know, it's a good, uh, a good position to be in and it's, it's, uh, it's a good time to refresh the team and to have people that have been in the form of Kalani who have been with us along the way and who understand some of the obstacles we had to overcome to get to where we are has been very useful. Uh, uh, if I go back in his history, he was at Anglo Coal, so he knows the coal mining industry backwards, so he's been a miner, essentially. Um, so, I mean, it was always our, ten- our intention to get to a position where these three businesses stand on their own and are successful. You know, it took us, I don't know, nearly 10 years to find the right part- partner for, for our bank. Uh, we ourselves as management, our board and our shareholders would never allow Grunod Bank to go to someone that we didn't think was appropriate and, and, and it happened to take this long. So that's why it happened when it did. Um, so no, the timing wasn't, uh, you know, Mike did stay on for a couple of extra years even. So, and that was to try and get us through the COVID uh, times. As it happens, I think it's a really good time for us to to get out the way and let Kalani and, and, and Cheryl uh, take on the responsibility of making sure that we I mean, Grinrod is an amazing uh, uh, organization that can really help sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, we st- stretch all the way up to the Congo, right? Mm-hmm. So, and we're doing projects in Lake Victoria and Uganda. So there's a lot for us to do on Africa. And I know it's a cliche, uh, but we really do believe that the time for Africa is here. And we need to make sure that the value that we can bring to the world, we can help uh, uh, participate in. Is so the- an exciting time for us. and. And, and, and the, Sorry. the, the Sorry. changes by government in th- allowing third parties onto Transnet, for instance, is this something that you've been waiting for? So, Alec, we've, uh, I mean, we, we didn't always expect it to happen, so it's been welcome. Uh, what we see that they're doing on the ports uh, in South Africa is wonderful. Uh, we managed to fortunately get through to the second round with uh, our Hamburg container partner on the Durban containers, uh, container terminal. Um, do we expect to get it? No, but the fact that they have introduced um, all these world-class operators of container terminals to South Africa and potentially going to come after with one of them as our lead container operator in Durban and again in Kucha, I think is for us as South Africa is world-class. I mean, we, that's exactly what we need is, is some of their operating skills to come and help train our people and build our businesses so that we can now all benefit. We'd love to get it, obviously, as Grinrod. Uh, but whoever gets it is going to help us all uh, to lift. And, and it's a welcome. And I know that uh, uh, Porsche and the Transnet team are working hard on rail and how rail can be operated by more than one party without causing huge uh, uh, operational problems. You can imagine the, the risk of allowing all sorts of parties onto a railway line. It's, uh, it's not a simple process. Uh, it's really difficult. So how that eventually turns out, um, we're not sure. We're certainly participating as, as far as we can in all those processes to see uh, how we can help. This N3 corridor between Durban and Johannesburg being the, the busiest road in South Africa, and of course, from a logistics perspective, it's, it's the, the main artery to the, to the heartland. If I recall, you are making an investment in Denver um, where, with your container ports, uh, an inland container port. Uh, how many of those do we need? Because uh, uh, driving to Durban, you see on the left-hand side from Johannesburg, there's a thing called the Port of Gauteng. And then a little bit further on, I know there's a highly controversial operation called Tambo Springs. How does all of this fit together? <laughs> the answer is right now, 
uh, uh, it would be re very really useful if they were all working. Um, and and what we've got to do is uh, is work to make sure that we can get the rail line working as efficiently as well. So um, you're absolutely right. And we noticed when we had that lockdown, dare we ever go back there? Uh, when you close Durban Port, the the country uh, stumbles along. Uh, the product that comes in and out of Durban Port is unbelievable. So um, it's a really important artery. Um, and, and of course, most of it is going through to Gauteng. So it, you have to have facilities, back of port facilities in Durban, and then, of course, facilities outside of Johannesburg where you're now going to unpack all of these boxes. Uh, and that's why we've invested at Denver. And there is indeed a massive area to the side of where our Denver facility is, the transit runs, uh, a container park. So there's lots of container parks in the Gauteng area. Uh, and yes, there are lots of other people are developing. Um, the key for us is that uh, we want to get it back onto rail, away from the road. And, and so there we are 100% aligned with Transit on, the, on all the work they're doing there. There was a line in your uh, commentary to the results which said the rail business showed an improvement in locomotive deployment. Now, what is your rail business mm. and, and what exactly does that mean? <laughs> so we had a really big rail business back in the day, Alec, but what we have now is we have 56 locomotives. Um, we run uh, 12, 12 or 14 locomotives in Sierra Leone uh, on a mine that runs uh, iron ore in, to the port, from the mine to the port. We, we run a, a lump, number of locomotives, probably around 12 in South Africa on mine sites where they're within the mine precinct, so we don't get come into the, 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 the contact with any other, uh, with the transnet freight rail, essentially, so we don't have to cross the, cross the, the, the operational difficulties of combining operations there. We have a couple in, in, in uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia and Dar es Salaam. So the trick for us is to deploy them all. We've got a number that we are busy refurbishing on. They have the major maintenance program, uh, and we didn't want to spend the money until we saw the opportunities within South Africa and elsewhere that we could deploy them. And, of course, now we are flat out on that uh, uh, heavy maintenance program to get them all onto, onto rail as soon as we can. So it's very exciting, the developments and the reforms that we're seeing in the freight system in South Africa, with uh, particularly being driven by Transnet. Absolutely. No, I think Transnet is absolutely on the right track. Understand, Alec, uh, they have in excess of 2,500 locomotives, and we have 56, right? So this is a, a major, major – rail is a major, major, major part of South African, South Africa's network and, and the success of South Africa. Uh, and, and we're a tiny little player on the side, which would like, like to help uh, where, wherever we can. And looking ahead – you sound pretty upbeat about the country's future, certainly the way you've been describing your, uh, your successor, Olani Mbambo, uh, who mm. seems to have a lot, of, uh, a, a lot on his plate, but clearly lots of opportunities. Uh, are you then going to be staying invested in Grindrod into the future? <laughs> Absolutely, uh, uh, Alec. Uh, uh, we, as I say, we were very fortunate to have a man of his caliber coming through our organization, and we, we made sure that we made the most of it, uh, and absolutely a supporter of him and the organization going forward. Um, my retirement depends on it, right? If he doesn't do well, I'll have to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and South Africa? Uh, yeah, no, 100%. Uh, I've just bought a new house closer to the beach, uh, so indeed I'll be here to contribute to South Africa for many, many years to go. Andrew Waller, Chief Executive of Grindrod, and he will be stepping down on the 1st of January 2023 when Olani Mbambo, the current Chief Financial Officer, will take over as CEO. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.